Hey, good morning, real life. Everybody good? Excited for church? Yeah, it's going to be a good day. Cannot wait. If you're a husband in the house, I hope you got something to write with. If you're a wife in the house, get your husband something to write with, because we're going to open up this series today. I want to kind of let you know where we're going, and then we'll come into today's topic. We're gonna, the series is called Love on Purpose, and um, we are, those of us that are believers that do claim to know Jesus Christ and have accepted Jesus Christ as our saviors, there is a particular qualification that Christ gives us in the book of John, chapter 13. And you say, well, I didn't know I had to be qualified. Didn't, no, it's his definition, so don't question me on it, all right? John chapter 13, Jesus comes to his disciples and he's talking to them and he says this. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Two verses there, he, or yeah, two verses he mentions the phrase love one another, another three times. In fact, he says it's so important that if you want the world to know that you are mine, then the way that they will know you are mine is how you love each other. Now, how many of you right now would say, Pastor Vince, I'm killing the game in this? It's kind of what I figured. Most of us don't love well. Now, we love, we love the people we love well. Like, how many of you love the people you love well? Yeah. I love my wife. I think I love her well. I love my kids. I love them well. I love some of y'all. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just kidding. I love all of y'all. I had to make sure. There's a couple different ways the Bible speaks of love in the Bible. And uh, as it does this, it, it mentions, and we'll just go to the Greek side of this, where it talks about the uh, phileo type of love, this is brotherly love kind of thing. Like, I, I, can look at, I can look at just about anybody and go, hey, I love you. I love you. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a, an understanding. It's, a, again, like a brotherly type of love. The word Philadelphia, that city of brotherly love, is, comes root out of that phileo word. And, and I get that. And so I can look at a lot of people. I, I, can look, I can look at Joe. I can look at different people in my life, friends that I have in my life, go, hey, I love you. It's not weird. Not weird at all because of the context of the type of love. Now, there's another one. It's called eros. It's where we get our word or the root of our word erotic comes from this. And so this eros, more intimate type of love. Now, that's designated in my life for one person. And her name is Jennifer. And she is the love of my life. And it would be really weird if I looked at several other people and said, I love you in minute in that context. I won't do it. In fact, I, I don't do it because I, I love my wife that way. And then, then we slip into this agape, this love without boundaries, this love without expectation or love without definition other than I just love you. And we struggle with that one. We, we struggle with just loving because we love, because we, we create point systems you know, if you do this, then I'll love you, or this is the kind of person that I'm going to love, and what you did by saying that is you've defined the kind of person you're going to love, and so you've eliminated other people from that. I love people as long as they're good. Well, then we're all out of luck because the Bible says there's none good, no, not one, so you don't get to love me because I'm not good all the time. If you'd have saw me in a drive through this week, you'd have known Pastor Vince has some issues we need to pray through. So I, 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 I'm learning this whole idea of loving on purpose is that we have to be intentional with our love. It's not something we get to hoard. It's not something that we get to hold in. And it's something that ought to be expressed. And it's not just because of the feeling we get when we express love, but it's because there's an evangelistic component, a discipleship component to it that says the world will not know you as mine if you don't love they're not going to get it. They're not going to understand it. And I know cultural, culturally we're getting things like the church is hearing things like this. Well, the church should stop calling itself Christians because the word Christian has a bad vibe right now culturally. And I go, baloney. See, uh, the Bible says in Antioch they were first called Christians, that little Christ. I, I, I want to be like Christ. And so if the word is Christian, then I'm going to own Christian. 
And I'm, I'm, be, I'm okay with that because I'm not, my goal is not to have the world to define me, but to live out the definition God has defined me with. And so just because the world says the word Christian doesn't work, doesn't take any authority away from the fact that that's who he sees me as, as a Christian, a follower of Christ. And so today we're, we're going to dive into some of this, this. Today we're going to jump on this idea of how men, how husbands are supposed to love their wives. Can I get an amen from anybody in the house? Okay, now, we, we had a lot of fun in the first service in regards to this because, well, marriage is one of my favorite topics to speak on. Jennifer and I, we have been married for a long time. We have a ton of kids. And I say that because sometimes I forget the number. Um, we're blessed. And every day, I would say at least once every day, I know there are moments that she looks at me and goes, <laughs> and ladies, can you, are you tracking with me that there's, there's not a word that you can use sometimes with your husband? It's only a sound that comes from the depth of your soul. Or maybe it's not a sound and it's, you, you can't roll your eyes any further back <laughs> because of something that your husband done or did or is thinking about doing or, or reference. I have, sometimes my mouth runs faster than my brain. Does anybody else have this issue? Okay, so I sometimes will say things that don't make a lot of sense. Like I will say things like, man, we haven't had pizza since the last time. <laughs> and Jennifer will look at me and go, Jesus, like you said that. Like I, you thought, man, that's a great thought to put out into the world. <laughs> to hear. We were uh, walking through Walmart. I use this reference a lot because it's my favorite. We're walking through Walmart and I grabbed one of the dry fit shirts. Kind of the stretchy ones that I don't wear any longer. You know what I'm talking about, that, that athletic fabric? I would rub that thing and I was like, wow. Like I would feel like, like, like you didn't have any clothes on, like you'd be like naked under your clothes. <laughs> and again, my wife pushing the cart was like, God. <laughs> I'm like, what? That's what I, and she's like, you're always naked under your clothes. <laughs> Valid point, dear. Valid point. I said one time that it seems like the car goes fa farther the more gas you put in it. Some of you right now are doubting your decision to allow me to lead you spiritually right now. You are go <laughs> you are going, oh gosh, look at the time. We can probably catch somewhere down the street. But I, I love being married to my wife because we, just, we have these moments together where we just look at each other and then we laugh. Here's the catch. We laugh at each other and then we laugh with each other and then we, we just love one another in a crazy way. And, and I just, I love preaching on this topic, not because we're perfect in marriage, because Lord knows I am not perfect at it. I will probably mess it up at some point today. My wife is a Chiefs fan. Yeah. Hey. And in regards to the Super Bowl, I am a baseball fan. No, I, I want somebody to win because it would be weird if they didn't, but like, I, I'm kind of rooting for the old guy. You know, not because he's a buck, because I don't care, uh, other than that the New York Yankees play in Tampa Bay, so there's a kind of a baseball connection. But, I don't, but she told me last night, she's like, we're gonna have to watch in separate rooms. If you're gonna cheer for the bucks, and I'm going to cheer for the Chiefs. We're going to have to be in separate rooms. And I thought, well, fine. But I get the big TV. <laughs> and we haven't really established where we're going to land on that yet. But I just, I just love being married. And people are like, well, you don't have my experience then, Pastor Vince, because the last thing I ever want to do again is get married. Well, if that's where God leads you, then I pray for you and I pray for the situation that God keep you healthy and God would maintain your heart and God would be everything that you would ever need in somebody else. And that's okay. I don't have, I don't have, a, I don't have any skin in that game. I don't have a, a hardcore direction to tell you. I know there are pastors who be like, it's better to marry than to burn, which is a biblical scripture. 
But you have to actually unpack the context to get to what that truly is saying and what the writer there is saying about that. But I do know that there has been an attack on family. There's just been an attack. And it's not a, it's not a recent attack. The enemy knows that if he can destroy a family, then he can destroy a church because that is, in essence, what we are supposed to be. And so today I want to just talk through this reality. As I was looking through Ephesians, I was sitting here digging around, and Ephesians chapter 5 is where we're going to be the day, today. And I'm, I'm going to read just a portion of Scripture. But as I was reading through, you start at chapter 5, verse 22, and you get the opening line about wives. And then you get three verses on how wives are supposed to be good wives. This is the writer saying, wives, here's what you need to do. Three verses. Three Then he jumps down to verse 25. Husbands. And the rest of the chapter is written to husbands on how to be good husbands. And I I don't know if it's, I don't know why we're just going to trust the Lord in that process. But I'm going to read this to you. And uh, some of you wives already know the statement that I'm going to start with because it's biblical. I'm going to start it right here. We're going to unpack it and then I'm going to read about the husbands. All right. First, uh, Chapter 5 of Ephesians, verse 22. Wives, wives in the house, say amen. Submit. Thank you for coming today. We're just going (laughs) to. Just kidding. Uh, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Biblical reference, Sarah in the Old Testament called her husband Lord. I'm just saying that I'm going to move on in the scripture right here. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husband. We're going to take a poll And it's a safe one. It's okay. How many of you, ladies, I'm just talking to the ladies in the house. How many of you ladies, I'm not saying you disagree with this statement because it's the Bible and you don't want to be a blasphemer. But let's just take it to a very real place and go, man, you know, I kind of struggle with that. We can use the word struggle. So how many of you ladies in the house, by show of hands, struggle just a little bit when you hear wives submit to your husband. Hands up, if it's you. Oh, first service was more honest than you guys. <laughs> I think they've been married longer. We were like, I'm, Pastor, do you need my name? I'll write it down. Um, it's, uh, I think the problem with the phrase, there's no problem with the phrase. The problem is how the words are presented a lot of times. We hear the word submit a lot of times we feel like it's surrender. Wives, surrender to your husband as if there is this great battle going on and because I'm the husband, I get to say it. And you must surrender your position. We get this whole image of caveman club ponytail dragging through the dirt, (laughs) right? Right? Or, or, or submit means that if he says it, then that's what we're going to do. It doesn't, even if his idea is dumb, the Bible says I just have to submit. That's, that's not what the Bible says. I want you to be clear. The word submission doesn't mean to, it just means to let go. I'm letting go and allowing. And we're going to get into the things that he ought to be doing here in just a moment. But I didn't want to just skip over the submit part because it gets twisted a lot and it gets turned to surrender. And that is not what God intended with this passage. It's not what God intended with this passage is to say, wives, you do nothing but everything that he tells you. Because I'm going to tell you straight up, most of the time us husbands, we're not thinking of something to tell you. Except when we are thinking of something to tell you and then we're never going to tell you what we're thinking we should tell you. I also think that there are times when we sit here as husbands and we go, I think there's just a different understanding. I think we don't understand each other a lot because husbands and wives don't typically have, I call it a table time. 
where you're able to actually come to a table and have a discussion on things that may be tense, but because you planned it, it's not an argument. It's a discussion. Hey, I don't know if I think this is a good idea or not. And it's done in confidence knowing. Jennifer sent me something this week that I thought was really, really cool. It was a, a picture that said, I love you more. And I know a lot of couples do that. I love you. I love you more. It's so cute. <laughs> 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 right? But this picture was really nice because it said, I love you more, but it doesn't mean that I love you more than you love me. It means that I love you more than the struggle that's coming. I love you more than the pain that we will endure together. I love you more than any argument we will ever have. I love you more than any trial that comes our way. I love you more. And that's got to be the mindset of both that says, hey, we've got to come to the table. We've got to figure this out so that submission doesn't become an issue. Now, here's the reason submission should never be an issue. Let's go ahead and jump into the nine verses that the writer gives husbands. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Do you hear the mutual submission in the passage? The first one told the wives, wives, submit to your husband. And we don't like that because it's very blunt. But in the very first verse to the husbands, guess what God tells the husbands to do? Give up everything for her. In essence, he could be saying, husbands, submit. Submit your drive. Submit your desire. Submit, just like Jesus did on the cross, for your wife, as Christ did. Submit that. Surrender the battle. It's not worth the fight. Or she is the only thing worth the fight. That you might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church. Because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound. And I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, however, let each of you one love his wife as himself. And let the wife see that she respects her husband. I believe uh, we have a right now media here at the church, and we offer that to everybody that's in the church. doesn't cost you a dime. You just have to log into it, set up a login, but it's thousands of Bible studies. And one of the Bible studies that's available in there is called Love and Respect. And it's a marriage Bible study that's very powerful, talking through the different needs of a husband and the different needs of a wife. How one desires love and security and safety and those type of things, and the other one desires, I just want to know that what I do matters to you. Respect. I need, I need to feel respected by you. It's really an amazing thing. And we see that they go through this. Husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. And you'll see amazing things begin to happen. I want to get into how. Just, I'm going to give you three things pretty quickly today. Three things on how you can love your spouse. How you can love your wives. How many of you want to love your wives better? Say amen. amen. Okay. Most everybody would agree with that. Unless you're super prideful and you just went, think I'm nailing it. <laughs> In which, listen closely, <laughs> all right? The first thing I want to tell you is this, is in, in the idea of how to love your wives. I am not a pro. I am the least romantic person that I know. I just don't think about it. Now, I, I, have, friends, I have friends that are around me that are pretty romantic. Like literally, the most romantic thing that I do is if a new issue of Magnolia Home, which is Joanna Gaines magazine, comes out, and I go get milk at Harps, I will grab a copy of Magnolia Home and some flowers, and I will take it home to her. So Jennifer pretty much knows that every three months, she's going to get a magazine and flowers. Because <laughs> I'm a creature of habit, too, because it's the same thing. Like we have a whole stack of magazines. I don't know if she's read all of them yet, but she has them and dead flowers, because they don't last very long. But that's really the extent of it. I don't think about, man, I should set up date nights, and we should have picnics by the lake, and kayak trips down the river, and we should do all. I don't think of those things. I am not good. When I proposed to my wife, my words were, if no one else wants to. 
Not my proposal. That sounded awful. It was our first date. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was, yeah, make sure I don't mix those two up. When I proposed, I didn't have a ring, and we had just had a fight. And I said, do you want to get married? She said, yeah. And I said, cool, I'll see you when I get back. And I left. <laughs> Romance is not my gig, all right? I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to be better at it because I want to love her better. We, want, we desire to love our spouses better. So husbands, today I'm going to talk to you. Wives, jump in, amen, shout, but don't elbow your husband through the rest of this sermon, all right? So don't do that, okay? Don't be texting him. You should hear this. Can't wait to make you listen at 6 o'clock tonight when it goes live. Now, I want you to really kind of lean in, and I want you to begin praying. Spouse for spouse, praying for one another. Because that's the only way it really works. When we submit to love and we love to submit, that's the only way it works is through prayer. So let's dive into this. How to love your wife. First, men, listen to your wives without fixing them. Listen without fixing. But that's what I do for a living. I fix things. She is not your job. Don't fix it. But Vince, if the problem is in front of me, I feel like it's my job to produce a solution. It's not your job to produce a solution in this situation. There's a study scientifically that talks about how many more words a woman uses than a man during a day. And if a woman doesn't have an opportunity to use all her words, the moment somebody shows up that she can use her words on, they will get the deluge of words that she hasn't got to use yet today. How many of you know what I'm talking about? You understand this? You're like, I got lots of words. Now, in my house, it's different. Jennifer is the quiet one. She's, she's very systematic and, and analytical in her thinking, and, and I am not. I'm more the emotionally driven one. I use all the words in our house. Like, there are no words left when I get done. Everybody's just exhausted, like, has he shut up yet? <laughs> I'll talk to the kids, and Jennifer's like, just tell them no. And I'll go to the kids, and I'm like, here's what we're going to do. This is the reason you cannot go, and these are the things that you could have done different would it allowed you to go. And she's like, why didn't you just say no? <laughs> I don't know. I, I couldn't help. There were words available, and so I used them all. <laughs> and so depending on who you are in the relationship, a lot of times it doesn't matter how many words you speak. Sometimes your wife will come to you, fellas, and they will just need to share something with you. It doesn't mean they need you to respond. It doesn't mean they need to answer from you. It doesn't mean they need to fix it. It doesn't mean that they have to have a solution in this moment right now. They just need you to listen. And when I say listen, I am speaking a different word than hear. Because a lot of times you can hear, but you're not listening. Any husbands want to say amen to that? Because here's the thing. We, if your wife is talking to you and there is a sporting event taking on, happening right in this general vicinity, and your eyes are cutting, you know, when you're trying to look at the ticker on the bottom because you muted it because you thought you were holy and listening to your wife, but you're reading the ticker on the bottom of the screen going, ooh, they won, I can't believe they won. And your wife goes, don't you agree with that? And you go, Yes, you do? No, no. And then you have to be honest and go, I have no idea what you just said because I was hearing you, but I wasn't listening to you. She tells me about her day, and I know you husbands are like, man, I don't know if I want to do that. Well, here's, let, me, let me listen to this scripture. It's found in Song of Solomon. If, you, if you've not read the book of Song of Solomon as a couple, I dare you, all right? That's all I'm going to say. Song of Solomon chapter 8, verse 13 says, Oh, my darling, lingering in the garden, your companions are fortunate to hear your voice. Oh, that let me hear your voice. Notice in this passage, there's not a place where he's going, let me hear your voice, and then I'm going to tell you what you need to do with what you told me. No, it was just enough to hear. It's just enough to take it in. It was just enough to listen. And you say, but Vince, I don't know that I need all of the information she's giving me to make it through my day. But let me just tell you, the information that she's giving you She's needing to release it so that it makes her day. She's got to just get it off of her. And you're her best friend. You're the one she should be able to come to. I don't want my wife confiding to anybody else but me. I want her to trust me at that level. I want her to love me like that. I want her to know that I love her like that. So listen to your wife without fixing. There's a great video on YouTube. If you go find it, it's called The Nail. And this video has got this woman sitting on the couch and she has a 16-penny nail sticking right out of her forehead. You're like, ah, that sounds 
extreme. Well, watch the video. It is extreme. But her husband's trying to tell her what's wrong. And she's like, I just have, I'm having these headaches all day long and I just don't know what's causing it. And he's like, you have a nail in your head. You have a nail in your head. And she's like, it's not about the nail. And she's like, every time I put on a sweater, it snags on the nail. And he's like, it's because you have a nail in your head. And the whole thing goes on until finally she says it's not about the nail. And he says, well, then let me just hold you. And he just holds, he just puts, and he holds his head like this because the nail's sticking out. But it's a great illustration of how you are to listen, but not always fix. They're capable of solutions. They're capable of being independent and strong and brilliant. God created them that way. Sometimes they, just like you are, they need a friend that just listens. Gives them a safe place to release some things. Second thing is lead your wife. Husbands, lead your wife. Lead your wife. Again, this is not lead your wife with a club. This is not lead your wife with strong directives. This is not lead your wife and not communicate with your wife. This is lead your wife. I don't want you to be her boss. God doesn't intend for you to be the, the, the taskmaster of the home. That's not what his intention was when he says to lead. We see this in the book of Genesis. We see Adam and Eve mess it up, or Adam mess it up pretty intensely. Chapter 3, verse 12 in the book of Genesis. You all know the story, right? Adam and Eve are in the garden. Don't eat of that tree. That tree is amazing, said the serpent. And they eat of the tree, and then they're hiding in the bushes, and then God shows up a little bit earlier, I think in verse 10, God shows up, and he says, hey, what, why are you, why do you, who told you you were naked? And Adam, like a boss in this moment, there are, listen, there are two people that exist, and then the one that created them is there. So there are three persons in this moment, and Adam blames everybody else on the planet except himself. God, this woman, you gave me. <laughs> it's her fault because you made her. <laughs> I'm like, this dude's a pro. Like nobody even taught him how to do that. And he just did it. <laughs> this woman, this one, and you gave her to me. So you know, she made me eat it. You go, wait a minute, there seems to be something wrong in this situation. I know there are people, I've heard it. I've pastored for 20 plus years now, and I have heard it my whole life. Where I've heard, I've been in church where people are like, boy, if Eve wouldn't have messed that whole thing up with the fruit in the garden, I'm like, you haven't read your Bible once, have you? What do you mean, Pastor? I said, I mean, it wasn't Eve's fault. It wasn't Eve's fault. Well, sure it was. She took the fruit. And I'm like, I know she took the fruit, but read the verse. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. The woman was convinced. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious. And she wanted the wisdom it would give her. So she took some of the fruit and ate it. Then she gave it to her husband. What are the next four words, church? Who was with her? I wonder how the story goes if Adam goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, babe. I don't know if this is a good idea. Like, I don't think this is a good idea. God told us we could be around the tree. We can, we can hang a swing in the tree if we want to. We just can't eat the tree. And that's what you're, you, you just, we're just stepping into it now. And I know you ate it, but God said not to eat it. And so I think it's my job to lead. And I'm going to just go, no. We're going to do what God said to do, regardless of how tempting the tree is. And man, it does look good. And there's juice falling out of the fruit. Oh, I want a bite of that. But we're not doing it. What if Adam would have been that husband? See, he wasn't. He was there in the moment with the ability to change the course, but he didn't. He didn't. And so often I wonder, husbands, so many times we get in these positions, and I'm not saying your wife's going to be wrong or make wrong decisions. You're both going to do that equally. Husbands, you're going to want to do something that's just not smart. And you've got to have this ability in your relationship to have conversations that are real. And you're going to have to lead sometimes. And sometimes, let's, here's the thing about leadership. Sometimes you're not going to make everybody happy when you lead. It's not going to make everybody happy. It doesn't change the responsibility. If God called you to lead, call you to lead. And, and I know our society, and I may take a little while with this, I know our society has changed that because if you watch any television show, any sitcom on TV, you know what the husband's role is? He's to be the idiot. Let's make him the idiot. 
One of my favorites was Home Improvement. I love Home Improvement. I laugh at that show all the time. And then I step back as a dad and a husband and I go, why is it every time he's the idiot? He's the one blowing up the garage. He's the one that's making a garbage disposal with a 350 Chevy in it. Why is, why is he the one that's wasting resources? And why is, why is he always the idiot? Because if the devil can attack the family. See, God, God didn't call you to only be the husband of your home, fellas. He called you to be the pastor of your homes. And that means you lead through it. That means sometimes it's not easy. But I will tell you, if you will lead consistently, a godly wife will follow. And they'll be happy to. Because you didn't leave them behind. You didn't run off. You brought them with you. Because that's what a leader does. A leader brings his team with him. A leader brings his spouse with him and says, no, no, no. I, I, you're better at this than I am. I know ultimately the responsibility is going to fall on me. But what do you think about this? Because this is more your wheelhouse than it is my house. What, what do you think? There's a back and forth. A good leader looks for wise counsel. That's a biblical principle. Why would that change in the house? Is wives supposed to submit? Read the word. Yep. But they're also supposed to follow a leader who is after Christ's heart. So do that. Last thing is this. Husbands, this is a lot of fun if you'll do it. Learn your wife. Learn her. You say, well, I know her. <laughs> okay. When Jennifer and I first started dating, we had been on a couple dates. When I met Jennifer, she was, man, she was cowboy boots and ropers and belt buckle, and, and I faked it. I went and bought me some Wranglers and some boots, and I bought a cowboy hat, and it was atrocious. It was awful. Because it wasn't me, but I, I thought, man, to get her attention, I'm going to have to look the part. And I am ignorant to all things cowboy and western. There's a great story about me trying to find a cow one time, and I, I don't have time to get into it. But I was not that guy. But we'd started dating, and slowly I started not wearing the cowboy hat, and I went back to some of my regular pants that fit. And uh, I've been dating for a while, and we got in the car. Some of you are going to doubt my spirituality on this, but we were in the car, and I turned it over to a rock station. An ACDC song came on. And I look over, and I'm driving, and Jennifer's over there going, and I'm like, she knows the lyrics to this song. I'm going to marry this woman. Because it didn't make any sense to me, because here she was, this... Clay Walker, Kenny Chesney, Brooks and Dunn girl, and she's over here rocking out to ACDC, and I'm, my heart is all a flutter. I didn't know what to do, and I'm like, I love her, and, but I, I didn't know that about her, and we've been married 20 plus years now, and guess what? There are still days I look at her, and I go, I don't know who you are. I didn't see that one coming. Really? You like that? Yeah, I kind of like that. I think that's kind of cool. I would have never guessed that you like that, ever in a million years. Holy moly, I need to spend some more time getting to know my wife, what, husbands, if I were to ask you, what is your wife's favorite memory? Well, it's got to be our wedding day. <laughs> I'll just let you ask her. Um, what's your favorite color? Before you answer, has it changed? Has it changed? Well, just because you picked a bridesmaid's dress in 1992 doesn't mean it's the same color today, because literally Jennifer and I, we were forest green and mauve for our merit wedding colors. I know, like, <laughs> if you were to ask Jennifer if she were going to do her wedding different today, she would go, yep. Somebody else, is that my timer? Am I done? No. Um, <laughs> 12 o'clock, it's time to shut her down, Pastor Bits. <laughs> the weighted chilies just moved to an hour. Wrap it up. <laughs> Learn. Your spouse, learn them. Ask them what their favorite color is. Wives, this goes both ways. You can learn your husband too. There may be things about you. Ask, ask questions, and here's what I want to do. I'm going to challenge you today. I want, I want to give you three questions that I want you to ask this week to one another. This is where you write stuff down. Put it in your phone, whatever you want to do. But I'm going to ask you to do this. Now, I typically don't give homework other than if God convicts you, but I'm giving you homework this week, church, because I want you stronger. I want your marriage stronger. I want your house stronger. I want the heart of your house to be Christ. So the questions I want you to ask is this. 
Do I listen to you well? Do I listen to you well? And be okay with whatever the answer is. It's not your job to go, whoa, uh, 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 all that stuff that you want to do. <laughs> you know the sound effects we make? Don't do that. Just receive the answer. Wives, give the honest answer. Sometimes you do. Sometimes it's not so great. Sometimes when you're preoccupied, I don't, I don't feel like you're hearing me. I feel like it's your job to take a minute and listen, and then you can go kind of decompress. And work it out. Just have a conversation. Do I listen to you well? Second question. Husbands ask her, how can I lead you better? How can I lead you better? Wives, be honest with the answer. Hey, I need your help with decisions on finances or decisions on this. I know you're not a money guy and you said I could handle all that, but a dismissal of responsibility is not the same thing as allowing someone else to work in their strength. And husbands, let me tell you this. The moment you decide to allow your wife to work in her strength and not make up for your weakness, your marriage will change. It'll change drastically. But so often we just put them in the role where they just, they're, they're supposed to be good at things I'm not good at. What if you're both good at the same thing and you get to be awesome at something? So ask, how can I lead you better? And finally, tell me something I don't know about you. Tell me something that would surprise me. What's your goal? You can use any of these questions. What's your bucket list? If I wasn't with you, what's something you'd love to do? And see where the conversation goes and just let it be a conversation. Put the kids to bed. Now, I will tell you, these same questions, they work with your children too. They work with your children too. Do, hey, kids, do you think I'll listen to you or am I too preoccupied to tell you what you should do rather than hear you? Kids, do you think I lead you well? Or are you confused most days on what you should do or shouldn't do because I haven't done a good job leading? And then ask your kids, tell me something about you that I don't know. And just have a conversation. You watch. It's going to be a lot of fun. There may be some tears. But praise God for it. If he strengthens you as a family, what a blessing. What a blessing it is. Because, see, we're supposed to love on purpose. So it means you have to be intentional in the process. I have to go, if I, if I want my marriage to change, I can't sit around and wait for somebody else to change it. I've got to do it on purpose. If I want my parenting to change, I've got to do it on purpose. I can't wait for somebody else to change my kids because I'm going to tell you right now, the world desperately wants to change your kids. So go get it. Go love them on purpose. Go love them with intentionality. Go love your spouse with that intentionality, fellas. Let's see what happens. I know it's not easy. It's a little foreign. Maybe culture's not used to that yet. That's all right. We're supposed to be in this world, but not of it. So it's okay if we're a little different. Amen? I want you to bow with me, church, if you would. Father, you're a good God. And Jesus, I thank you for your mercy, for your grace, and for your love. I thank you for the partners and the people you have put in our lives. God, I thank you for my wife. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for my family. God, you, you've been so, so good to me. And Lord, we don't always get it right. We don't always get it right. Lord, help us always to point to you. Help us always to be stepping towards you. And the moments we step out of that, God, please help and bring us back into alignment with where you'd have us to go. Help us to listen, help us to lead, and help us to learn as believers. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen.